All right, all right. So we are here to talk about how to invest in short-term rentals. We're gonna go through, we're glad you're here. Welcome to Grid. Dalton, we ready to get started? All right, let's do this thing. Sweet. Corey, let's take it away. What's up, everybody? Welcome. Happy, Oct <laughs> Happy October. Glad to see everybody here. This is a great room. Thank you again for another amazing turnout. Super excited to have everybody here. What is Grid? Well, Grid is this, right? This is a global real estate community brought here to a hyper local level. This is a spot that was built by investors for investors. We always like to say, like, we are not here to be like gurus to pontificate on high. We are just real people doing real deals in real time here to share our experiences with you and trust that you're going to share your experiences with others in the room as well, because we know that that's how we all continue to learn and grow. So super excited to have everybody here tonight. Really, really stoked for this. So, and what is Grid? Grid is a relationship engine and it's a trust transfer, right? When you build in a community like we build over two years and you see a lot of familiar faces here, even if you're new, there's a social vetting there. It's really easy to meet people. It's really easy to do business together. It's really easy to collaborate, right? We can go faster or farther together. So that is our mission, right? If you know more than us, we want to learn from you. We want to do business with you. If you're brand new, we're here. We want to teach you. Somebody taught us. And there's a lot of people that have that same kind of servant's heart here. So we're glad that you're here, right? Um, and the mission of all this is we really believe that building wealth and creating impact through real estate is really possible. It's one of the last meritocracies, right? Anybody can build wealth in real estate. And so we're here to open those doors and we're gonna take you on a journey. If you're just getting started, awesome, in January, we're gonna start this thing over again. And we're gonna start with some basic foundational mindset models, right, that we can apply as we work back up to the more complex topics. Absolutely. So with that said, yeah, exactly. We welcome everybody, all investors, all experience levels. We're just here to share our experiences and give back. And again, we're hoping that you're going to do, do the same in all of this. So uh, really quick, who are we? Justin, who are you? Yeah. My name's Justin Myers. I'm a Virgo uh, <laughs> from Florida. So what am I? I've, I've been on a very circuitous path. I started in real estate when I was 23 in Tampa as a mortgage broker. And over the last, gosh, 18 years, I have sat in almost every role you could think of in real estate, right? A lot of facets of the industry, and I've worked in investing in a lot of different seats, whether it was working uh, for a team that sold REOs for banks, that had sold 3,000 real estate-owned properties, foreclosed properties, right? Or running teams or working in the background. So that's who I am. I run Grid with Corey, and we run a real estate team together called Casa Knoxville. It's part of a national uh, real estate model that Keller Williams has. Love it. Well, my name is Corey. I, my real estate journey began when I was 22. I bought my first house. I started kind of house hacking at an early age, AKA just roommates, right? Uh, got two of my buddies to come take over the other two bedrooms, use that income to just offset the cost of the home and just continue to kind of build and scale over that. I found a really fun hustle in the 2010 through 2013 phase where I was going to local auctions and buying lots in distressed subdivisions where they'd kind of tanked with the crash. And I would find those lots for say average of $3,000 and turn and flip them to some of the neighbors for eight or 10 grand. It was a great little side hustle that helped me build some cash, build some of that entrepreneurial spirit while I was still working in restaurants uh, in, the, in the background. I became a restaurant owner operator at 24 and then continued to do that for another seven years while just passively investing in real estate on the side. After moving here, I just jumped fully into the uh, sales role. I really loved the investor space because it was just a great way to really be creative, problem solve on a regular basis and meet a lot of cool people along the way. Yeah, so if you want, there's two different models that we've looked at together, right? If you want to look at, hey, here's how you come in, making a basic salary and just hustle and hack, especially if you're an agent, right? And get to building a portfolio and get to a million dollar net worth, right? That's Corey, someone you can talk to. I've had the, the ability and the capacity to look at it sometimes on an institutional level or work with guys that were doing higher level spec houses or sometimes we're doing commercial, got into short-term rentals back in 2010. Um, when I was negotiating short sales at a transaction coordination company and I was working with realtors and auctioneers and uh, commercial agents. Um, and when the market had really turned there. That was the only place here that really went through the bubble. So we've had two different levels of experience. Um, definitely listen to Corey if you want to learn how to make more money quicker and keep it. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you want to hear some cautionary tales, I, I'm happy to share them. I've seen, I've seen a lot and I've, I've written some of my own. Yeah. Awesome. Love so that. what do we want to accomplish today, right? We want to 
take you all on a journey, want to answer some questions, uh, I'm, ready to get, I'm ready to get started. So real fast, let's do community intros. Yep. Everybody signed in. Um, I don't know where Allison's at. She'll be coming. Is she out, out front? Yeah, she'll be working away in the back. Okay, great. Who is looking for, who is looking for some capital today? Who's got a project or, or something they need capital? They need private lending, conventional lending, commercial lending. Who's looking for capital for a project? I see, I see a couple of hands go up. Fantastic, right? Who's got a deal to shop? Anybody got something? Zach. Zach is the only person, since everyone apparently should know Zach Cliff, he's the only guy with the deal in the room, so he should have 30 people around him when we get off. Anybody? I got some deals to shop. I just heard about two other eight, eight units. I got called right before we got started. Corey's got something. Y'all got deals for days, definitely. Anybody else got some deals if someone's looking for an asset? Okay. All right. Who's just here so they don't get fined? <laughs> okay. Great. Who's a contractor? Who's got a, who's got a, a service, right? You're a, lend, you're, you're a contractor. Yes. Perfect. You're insurance. You do. Uh, thank you so much, right? Okay. So we got three, three contractors. What am I missing? Who's a real estate agent in here? Oh, I love it. I'm so glad you're here. Awesome. Awesome. You guys too? You guys too? Who's a lender in here? I see some lenders in there, right? So they got the money. Fantastic. Or they're too cool to raise their hands because everyone, they don't need a new business. I see you back there, Nate. So, uh, hey, Jade. Our one and only, that is, if you don't know the lovely Jade Ross, you should. She's incredible. Um, and she loves attention from the stage. All right. So we've got that... Uh, if you don't want your information shared, if you're not cool with being connected, just come grab us after the meeting, no problem. We've got a list of what everyone's looking for, and we'll make some connections for you in this coming week. Does that sound fair? If you told me you're looking for a contractor, I will make some connections and say, hey, here's the three or four contractors that are in the room if you want to reach out to them. Is that cool with everybody? Say yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. I love it. Legal Disclaimers, ease. and we'll kick you, you can kick it off. Okay, legal ease. So we are realtors, we are not tax professionals. Attorneys, accountants, appraisers, inspectors, right? What we are experts on is talking about the market uh, and acting as fiduciaries for our clients. So anything else, take this with a grain of salt. And investing is not a zero sum game. You can lose money investing in real estate. People frequently lose money investing in real estate, right? So make sure you're getting some competent advice right? Make sure we're investing money that we can afford to, to lose in the long term, right? It's a long-term game, real estate. You can be very successful. Just be aware, like, you can lose money. We talk to people all day long that make some unwise investments. Yeah. Not y'all, because you're here. So Naturally. don't sue us. <laughs> yeah. And finally, as you can tell, we're recording. We're doing some content. So this is just a, a public notice that you are being filmed and photographed, and if you don't consent to being filmed and photographed, it's not a problem at all. We are live streaming this currently. It's on, on Facebook. You can check that out or sit in the back, you know, but just, just be cognizant we are recording this. Cool. Simple enough. Let's get started. Let's do it. Corey, what's a short-term rental? Sure. Uh, your short-term rental, right, as a quick definition, is just going to be a, a furnished vacation-style property that you're renting out on some form of shorter basis, right? Nightly, Three day stay, week stay typically is going to be how this type of property or this type of asset is going to be utilized. Right? There's a whole different subject subsection in there. Once we get into is going to be our midterm rentals or long term, whole different thing to dive into. All right. It's certainly just a process. Like when looking for these, there's been a lot of websites that have come up over the last what decade or so that have really made this a lot easier to go ahead and actually facilitate. Yeah, so let's talk about the history of that. I remember HomeAway and Verbo used to be two separate sites. And when I started, God, it was back in 2008, I was working for somebody, and we were using both of those for vacation rentals down in Florida. So those, Airbnb didn't exist. You know, those were two of the bigger players in the space. There's a couple others, because we've always had vacation rental markets, right? That, that concept always exists. There's places outside of the Smokies, whether that's, you know, the Florida beaches or mountain towns, right, or some of these resort towns like Joplin. This is not new. What is new is the democratization of this, right? We've had these disruptors come into the space. 
like Airbnb that were directly competing and trying to disrupt the hotel industry. And so we've seen an explosion and then the pandemic really just put it into overdrive. Really kicked it off right? at that point. Yeah, because everyone was working from home and things got real fluid, real weird. There was lots of income uh, and people were looking to get out of places where they were locked down. So we've got this explosion in these in these sites. We've got some new sites that didn't exist before. So it's easier to run this play. Yeah, 100%. Why do you do it, Corey? Why would you want to do a short-term rental? Generally speaking, when people are really looking to do this, right, it's just... Money, money, money. Cash rules everything around me. I think Wu Tang said it best. Cream. <laughs> Get the right. money. Uh, so, generally, when you're. When thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank you. Dollar, really dollar bills, y'all, <laughs> is how we get down in this family, just in the future. Yeah. We will always reference Wu Tang in every one of our meetings. So, just be prepared next time. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so, typically, though, in the right areas, you're going to see a much, much higher return when it comes to your rent rate. So typically this is gonna be anywhere from three, five, even 10 X your typical monthly revenue you can see using this type of asset. Which is awesome, right? Yeah. I mean, what's the downside? Higher expenses, but what's the, what's the possible downside with higher rent? So Corey, who in here owns a short-term rental? Yeah, it's currently? a poll. Put your, put your hands, hands up. up. Like, who's, got, who's got them? Who's got some short-term rentals? I'm looking for, I see some, I see the cool kids in the back, right? I see some folks here have some short-term rentals. Fantastic. Yeah, you can get up. Who's interested in acquiring a short-term rental? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. What, what's got you on the, on the fence about it? What's, what's the... Uh, I'm looking to help manage the properties and then grow that income to then purchase one. Got it. Got it. Cool. So the long-term goal would be you want to you buy one. Fantastic. So we're going to say you want to buy one because that's going to get you there. You're going to buy a portfolio of them. Fantastic. What was your name? Joseph. Joseph. So Joseph is looking to acquire short-term rentals. You should bring them to him. And while you're bringing him these short-term rentals, you should talk to him about letting him manage those properties because that's what he wants to start doing, right? That's going to be the active income play that funds the passive income. Great. Yeah, love that. Yes. So, Corey, where does this work? Typically, when you're going to go do this, go look for places that people are already staying in short-term spaces. So think your vacation areas, areas around convention centers, beaches, mountain towns, like our beautiful, beautiful, beautiful Pigeon, Pigeon Forge, Forge Gatlinburg, Gatlinburg right? right? Terrific area, one of the one of top areas in the entire country at this point. So those are gonna be your best bet when you're lo actually looking to dive into this market. Start really just going where it is rather than branching out into some niche middle of nowhere spot that you think is gonna like turn around and just blow up. Like go where the money's at. Yeah. So. Where do you, I saw some hands get raised. Where do you, where do we own short-term rentals? Let's get interactive here. Who's got some in Sevier County? Yeah. Where, where's yours, Emily? Sevierville. Sevierville? Fantastic. Where's yours, Pete? I know you got several, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so Pete's got, you know, some cabins and a bed and breakfast, right? Uh, or not a lodge, I guess is probably yeah, the better term for it. So and those are those are in Gatlinburg and Sevierville. Towns and so the cabins are in Sevierville and Gatlinburg, and the formerly bed and breakfast now a lodge is in Townsend. Yes. Okay. Who's got something not there? Who's got Where's Valley maybe or or Pigeon Forge or anyone outside of those areas? Yeah. Where's yours, bud? Awesome. So where's yours actually located? So he said. Folks visiting downtown Knoxville and the university, where, where's your, your short-term rental located? Awesome. So South Knoxville, just two miles like on the other side of the river. Yeah, great. In the county? In the city. Interesting. We'll come back to that. Yeah. See how that plays out. Who else has one outside of Sevier County? Yeah. Vision Forge in Pittsburgh. Vision Forge in Pit Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Gotcha. Yeah, when did you pick up the one in Pittsburgh? Uh, a year ago. Just okay. my one-year email. Okay, great. And is that like uh, your is that same thing like metro activities close to like it's what's that? College campus. Okay, yeah. great. Are you asking who has Airbnb? I am. Yeah. Yeah. Where is it located? Uh, Teleco Village. Teleco Village. Ooh, that is genius. Yeah, that is real. genius. So. Are you getting people that are vacationing there? Are you getting people that are looking for to relocate there? Yeah, it's a combination. It's a combination, right? right? Because that is a market where there are no rentals. I wish Julia Hurley was a little closer. I would tag her in this, right? But Teleco is a market where there's no, she was just talking about a short-term rental in Teleco Village. Yeah, I was actually just Yes. Yes. 
All my people that are so far away, come closer. I would, I would be talking to you. I know all of you. Come. There's the room up front. Get in here. I've got a new build in Teleco Village. I'll get the information on that. It's okay. So Nathan's got a new build in Teleco Village. But that's another. So there's a couple of different models around here. We've got some folks, right? Uh, so one of our, Corey had a, a great listing here. Um, actually is off market just on 4th Avenue, right off Hall of Fame. Oh, yeah. Right off Hall of Fame. I've stayed in that one. I had some friends come and stay in that one. That's zoned commercially. Um, so that's that kind of downtown Knoxville play. Anybody, someone else was talking about, right? You want to run one out of your out of your residence? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great play. Is anyone doing that with an accessory dwelling unit? Or they are like at a garage apartment or something? I'm getting one ready right now. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Mechanicsville. Car no, he's got a carriage house in Mechanicsville. What's your name? Uh, Dominic. Dominic. So Dominic's got a carriage house in Mechanicsville. Yeah. What's a carriage house? If I don't uh, know just, that terminology. Uh, just a fancy name for guest house. Awesome. Yeah. So like a, a cool, got it, carriage yeah. house like it would have yeah. been because it was it's time. Carriage house. Right, what's carriage what's carriage. the age of the? Uh, 1899's property. So that's why that's why it's a carriage house, guys. Like history class because there wasn't wasn't cars then. So instead of a garage <laughs> apartment, we got a carriage house apartment. Stay with me. I'll get there. I'll get there, right? Awesome. Yeah, but it's, it's super close to campus, so we're going to start pumping up the football weekend. Awesome. Year, so. so the play there, if you know Mechanicsville is, very close to campus, so you got a huge upside there for football weekends, and then you're going to have, I imagine, some other people that are just looking to come here, visit the area, looking for, right? Who likes staying in an Airbnb instead of a hotel? Anybody search there first? Yeah, there we go. That's why we're having this conversation. That's why we're having that conversation. Weird. I got kids. I like a hotel. It's a lot cleaner and quicker and easier yes. with kids. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Uh, prior to kids, totally loved the Airbnb thing. But now with kids, I dig a hotel. Yeah. I will say from traveling with people over the last couple of years, I do like the idea of my own hotel is a little more appealing when I travel sometimes because I'm like, I don't sleep when there's mm. 10 of us in the in the cool house. Um but I personally, I love, I love an Airbnb. There's some sick ones out there, though, for sure. Yes. So what kind of, I think we covered some of this. What kind of properties work for an Airbnb, Corey? Yeah, really, on your, uh, any of these, traditionally going to be looking at, at single-family properties, although some multifamily can work into there. You're going to be looking at your single-family homes, your townhouses, your condos, a tent. I mean, in all actuality, right? Check out a website called Hip Camp, and you'll totally see where that is a full model where you can throw a tent in the middle of a field and, and make it happen. I stayed, we, so we're going to talk about a guy that's glamping. I stayed in a really great yurt on a, on a farm in Asheville, outside Asheville, and it was fantastic. We did all the things in Asheville. We went outside, and they had maybe 16 or 18 units, so some existing cabins that must have been there before, and then they had some yurts set up there. We can get into like how that model works. Really interesting. You can run that play some places you wouldn't normally be able to do Airbnbs, actually. True that. A yes. big point, though, is just making sure that you're doing what's – conforming already in the area to an extent, right? Like don't break the model if that's what's working. If that's what's desired in that space, go into that, especially on your first go around with this. Yeah, so let's, what could you run across? If you're attached, you know, so if you're, if you're sharing a wall with somebody, that could be an issue. If you're really close to your neighbors, that could be an issue, right? Um, and this comes up in interesting ways. Do a little research about Hell's Kitchen. Airbnb has got really popular in New York and the residents in Hell's Kitchen, it's always been a residential neighborhood, got really frustrated because instead of having a dry cleaner in their neighborhood now, right, now there's bars in their neighborhood and they were never a bar district, right? They might go to bars. They were leaving and going to other neighborhoods to go to bars, right? They need a bodega, right? People that are coming from out of town, what do they want? They want some sort of a bar and it really changed the composition. So you're naturally going to get pushback from neighbors when you come in and you negatively, you know, uh, affect their experience of living in the, in the residence. And we're seeing that with some regulations, right, Corey? Absolutely. Yeah. We certainly you see it in Knoxville. There's, uh, you've seen it in some big, met, big metros. Right? New York just had a big thing. Dallas, Fort Worth just totally like passed, passed a sweeping moratorium uh, and shut down on short-term rentals. So it's stick to areas that are already doing this. So the key is to do some research, right? Yeah. And what you want to look at when I'm doing my research is what size and style of property. And to be very clear, we're going to have, I think, a little separate conversation about Sevier County because Sevier County is its own animal, right? There's a reason why 15 million people come here. Like some of this is just a general model. Hey, you're trying to run this anywhere outside of Sevier County, 
right? You're trying to run it in Knoxville or Mechanicsville. We want to run through that model first, and then we can map that on to Tefasiri County. Yes. So what is the catch? Ooh. Big one here. Big takeaway is just remember that this is the hospitality business. This is not the housing business. And they are two totally different things altogether. Like you're not providing like a long-term rental household. This is a hospitality business and you are becoming your own hotelier at this point, right? You're just running it on a small level. Who works, who's worked in, in hospitality? Yeah. Who, who likes that. people that's worked in hospitality? <laughs> yeah. That's, yes, you're going to do well, right? Like if you, if you enjoy providing guest yeah. service, this is right up rally. And both Corey and I come from a background in hospitality, right? Yeah. So. Um, take care of people that take care of you, right? But it's really, it's critically important that you catch that, that this is a hospitality business, right? This is all based on feedback and ratings and it's five stars and ideally nothing less, right? 4.7 and below is not really an acceptable rating on those platforms. So, and I think it's important to talk about this because Corey's up here. Corey worked at a place called Long Doggers and go check out his story, right? Because Long Doggers is a, is a beach bar. They sell, um, you know, hot dogs. They got some poke bowls, but it was just like a, the hot dog joint is, is the base. Mm -hmm. The menu expanded. It's my dad's favorite place. We, we both come from the same place in Florida. Um, and now that place is a hub, right? It is, it is a central part of the community. They built a community around Long Doggers, right? It's where the teams go to celebrate Little League. You run events there. You've done a lot of cool stuff there. It's the same sort of thing. How are you creating an experience and not just a house? So what yeah. is that? How did you do that? Like, what's your approach? I think we can pause for a second here. When you're dealing with guests, mm -hmm. like, what was your mindset? Because you're dealing with the general public making 10 Dollar transactions to what thirty dollar transactions like, so it's volume. Yep. Repeat business. Consistency. Okay. Ooh. Huge, in there being able to provide consistent service, the same thing, every single time to the best of your abilities. Right. Understand that you're still a person and you're working with other people, and so mistakes are gonna happen. Right. And so you need to be anticipatory of that to make sure that mistakes don't happen or you learn from your mistakes and. In, I would say if it, as it applies to, to this, like be prepared to be providing anticipatory service for people mm -hmm. that really goes above and beyond. Mm -hmm. That's going to leave a really good lasting impression that's going to cause people to come back on this. And same token, if there is an issue that arises, you need to go above and beyond to take care of that person and resolve the issue. So what do you do when you have a negative experience? How do you turn that? I think that's probably one of the most important things we can talk about as a short-term rental host, how do you turn that around when something's not right? Mm -hmm. own like how do you, how do you own, handle, yeah, that? Yeah, own it first. Like, acknowledge it, because people ultimately just want to feel heard, right? When they're voicing a complaint on something, they just want to feel understood and heard. So coming from, like, a space of, like, empathy and mm -hmm. really wanting to, to take care of this person, understand, like, why they're frustrated. Like, yeah, it sucks I'm getting called on a Saturday night, too, because this thing happened, right? Like, they're equally mad as me, but, like, I have to empathize with them and put myself in their, in their shoes and work to solve that as best I can, as quickly as I can. And again, yeah. go above and beyond because you've got to overcome what they're going through, right? Just making it like clean and easy doesn't change the, that taste in their mouth as it were. Would anyone that owns STR say there's a, or even if you've been in one, there's a higher level of expectation? When you go to a short-term rental, is there a higher level of expectation than if you're just renting an apartment? Where you're like, eh, you know, whatever. Like the bathroom's not, I see some heads nodding. Yeah, right, because it's your vacation. And a vacation is an experience, right? If you wanted to deal with, with a leaky shower, you could do that at home. You got, you got the leaky shower you make the kids use, right? Like you could do that at home if the door sticks, right? Yeah. Or if the cable's not working. That's the stuff. You're on vacation to get away from that. And so there's a higher level of like those people that are contacting you, that may be the only vacation they go on that year. It may be the first time they've seen their loved ones, right? So if the AC goes out, it's a big issue. How do we... Now, it's also a great opportunity. If you're in real estate, you know that stuff goes wrong constantly. All the time. Right? Challenges are a great opportunity to turn. You can turn those into great reviews, repeat business. Like, how you address that actually can be a really uh, a killer edge in your business. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, man. And if you want to wrap up this later, let's, let's talk about this. We can go deep on 
on hospitality and like what it means to deliver like a Ritz Carlton experience. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what do we got to keep in mind? Big thing really just keeping in mind is just looking out for those jurisdictions. They are taking on some legislation, changing out that. So just because something works as a short-term rental now does not necessarily mean that you're protected forever in this space. Right? That's where we've seen like those, those neighborhood complaints yes. that has changed like entire cities turn around can start from like one spot. Um, so making sure that you're just aware of the, the zoning rules that are in place, tax structure, mm -hmm. any additional uh, HOA restrictions, travel trends, how things are moving, the seasonality of your market is going to be important to, to make sure you study and understand to prepare yeah. for, for any changes there. If you've got a rental, if you have a rental, let's say on Norris or Douglas, right, it's going to be really seasonal. Once that pool drops, it's really going to fall off. I see... The gals from Vacasa nodding, right? Yes, because you know. How many do y'all manage locally? They manage over 700. So if you want to, to get some resource, if you haven't, if you haven't met uh, Vacasa, grab them before they leave. Um, I'm glad they're here, right? We're trying to bring you some experts here. Um, let's talk about legislation. Can I talk about yeah. right now? Yeah. yeah. Who's got some comments? Who's got some concerns? Anybody feeling nervous about the future of short-term rentals locally? Knoxville, Knox County. So Norris Lake, seventy-five percent of the homes are now Airbnb, and the California HOA uh, president he wants to make sure it doesn't happen like Norris. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a lot of, uh, of friction or opposition to having Airbnb. Yeah. So you need to, you need to kind of watch out for those things. What was your name? Karina. So what Karina said, shared was because she's out in Teleco Village, has a short-term rental in Teleco Village, that Norris Lake, uh, according to her, is 75% of the properties there are short-term rentals around Norris Lake. Um, and that Teleco Village is pushing back, which does not surprise me, uh, yeah. from dealing with the HOA, has some issues with the short-term rental. Like they are actively pushing out short-term rentals. Let's talk Knoxville and Knox County. Corey, I know you had some inside info, right? What's what's coming in Knox County in terms yeah. of, of legislation? Right. So we all, I'm sure most of us might know that in Knox city limits specifically, they've already taken that action to really prohibit short-term rentals. That's why they issue type one and type two permits. So your type one is designated for your single family areas. It's designed to be an owner occupied residence. You can move out for the weekend when the vols are playing, rent it out. You got the ADU in your backyard. You got a basement you can furnish out. All of that applies, right? Otherwise, the type two permit is where they want it a commercially zoned property, which are rare to find, right? The single family homes that happen to be zoned commercial, those you can have that type two permit, which is going to allow you to operate that as a non-owner occupant. Now, where people have pivoted there is just go to the wild west of Knox County, right? Because there's no legislation in place regarding short-term rentals. And so it was, I think August was now they've started a uh, proposal to limit the uh, short-term rental rules here in Knox County. So being mindful of that, if you're already in the space, like being aware of any upcoming legislation changes that could occur, because there are talks about it right now. Has anyone defined what short-term rental time period is? I know that some places that I've stayed, it was one month. I, think it was I believe it's less than 30 days is what, uh, is what Knoxville considers a short-term rental. The state of Tennessee. Just so Dominic said the state of Tennessee is less than 30 days, which is pretty, pretty common. If we look at our rental guidelines, they're going to be written that way, right? Because if it's a 30-day rental, that could be a month-to-month -month lease. It's going to fall within a whole bunch of existing frameworks that already exist. If you've got less, and why have they done it that way, right? The state of Tennessee is pretty friendly to the owner and the consumer. Property rights are pretty strong here. So I have the right, hey, I can rent this out. I can rent my property out. You know, it's not really impacting this if I'm using this for the vols and I'm going to stay with my girlfriend or whatever, my brother here, or I'm renting out the basement. It is properties that exist only, right, as a short-term rental. I'm out of state. I've got nothing vested. I don't care if the neighbors, right, if they're being rowdy and, mm -hmm. and, and causing issues. So I think there's a, a balancing act they're trying to hit, whether they hit it well or not. Um, but it's definitely being discussed on a county level. Was that, have you talked to? That was a, it was an article in the Sentinel that I saw 
here just like towards the ten tail end of August that, that they're starting to kind of push this through. I'm trying to remember the representative's name that introduced it. Who can who who's familiar with OS zoning that might be able to shed some light? There is some OS zoning, right, that you were just sharing has yeah. You're able. Yeah. OS, you're able. Like OS zoning in uh, Knox County and Knox City limits, you should be able to do um, short term rental on. There is a small sliver of it on the other side of the river in South Knox that has it. And I have a few friends who have short term rentals down there. So, um, is it SW1, SW1 now? And SW2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I just know that there's another zoning that mm -hmm. we can we can do. So. And if you haven't had the call call local zoning. I just had to go through this. We were looking at developing a local property. I think despite the complaining, I think the city and the county are both very easy to get information from. Now, going through the review process, a little different, but in terms of getting information on the front end, they have been very helpful in telling me what might fly, what wouldn't fly, who else I should call, having some conversations and explaining the zoning, the zoning to me. So I just would recommend going down there, chatting with them. They try to be pretty transparent. If anyone has seen the South Waterfront, that existed as a diorama for like a decade in the city county building before they did it. And you could have walked in there and they would have told you, I'm surprised everyone didn't buy up South Knoxville, but you know, they may think it was coming. So they've been very helpful. All right, so. Just pro tip, man. Stick to where it's already working. Like the Smokies. Like the Smokies. Right. This is your Myrtle Beach, Panama City, Destin. These are already like large markets that are already, have been doing this forever. I mean, for 50 years or more at this point. So the, the likelihoods of those areas that are so tourist driven dependent, the likelihood of them actually passing any kind of legislative change in there probably pretty low. Like they're not going to shoot themselves in the foot. Has anyone seen uh, the new regulations that have been put in place by Gatlinburg and Sevierville and Pigeon Forge on short-term rentals? Yeah. They're, they're not. Yes. Why, why it's saying yes. Would you agree? They're not very onerous. They're not too rigid. No, I talked to, uh, again, just called up and talked to wasn't the master planner. It was whoever was working underneath the master planner in Sevierville. They put in some restrictions to basically just everything isn't automatically grandfathered because you may have a short-term rental in a neighborhood where it's changed over the years and they've decided, hey, this is a residential neighborhood. She said she had to turn down four when I spoke with her. That would have been over the summer, right? They're not actively, right? This is an area that's run. There's It's hard to get an estimate of exactly how many cabins. Interestingly, I can't get anyone to tell me. No one, No one actually knows. Even, even the government doesn't know. So they're just now trying to, to start permitting so they have some idea of what's going on so they can start doing some, some safety inspections, I guess. Permitting fee is relatively low. And then there's some, in the cities itself, there's some pretty minimal permitting. Um, you might have to go through a review process if you choose to go out there. Otherwise, right, there's more cabin beds than there are hotel beds out there. The entire economy is based off of short-term rentals. That is never going to go away out there. Marcus. All here. Um, so, uh, I talked to a lady. She's actually. Don't worry, bud. <clears throat> I thought it was cool information. I talked to a lady the other day. She's the head of tourism for uh, Knoxville and uh, uh, state of Tennessee. And uh, she actually informed us that this past year that the number one revenue for Tennessee now is tourism and no longer agriculture. Wow. That is, let that sink in, right? Fascinating stat. Wow. That, is, that is us the changing. That's the composition of us changing. And this is not that different from Florida. Do anyone know that Florida is one of the biggest cattle producing states? Right? Yeah. Fifth biggest cattle producer in the country. I grew up down in Florida. And central Florida used to be, the reason why there was nothing there but Disney, it was all cattle land. Agricultural. If you go all the way in the middle of Florida, right, it is nothing but agricultural. So we're just seeing a change in the priorities of the state. We've got 170,000 new jobs here in the last four years. I keep cutting out, Corey. Uh, is Dan McKee in the room tonight? No, so Dan went to the governor's breakfast. He was sharing that with us. 30 billion invested in the last four years, 170,000 new jobs in Tennessee in the last four years. We are on a rocket ship. 
Locally, we are growing at twice the rate of the national economy. It doesn't look to change anytime soon. Now I'm cutting out. Anyways. We can trade off. Now you're good. So just get how do we get started? <laughs> yeah, just getting started, right? So just starting to figure this out. What do I do? Where do I even go? Go to the basics. Start with Airbnb. Start researching the market around you. Start looking at areas that people already like to travel. I mean, that they already have Airbnb has the biggest market share. That's why I just keep keep, keep driving towards that because they already kind of have the largest market share when it comes to the short-term rental booking space. And so using that as your search engine platform is going to be one of your main spots to go to when you're just trying to look to see who's doing what in the space. Who's just getting started that has some questions? This is going to go down as the quietest grid I have ever been to. Yes. What about a theme? Airbnb. I love it. We're going to come back to that. That is a great question. And we're going to go deep on it. That is an excellent idea, right? And we're going to show you some of those. But yes, what about a theme? What else, horse? We're kind of more moving towards the midterm rentals. Okay. Furnish Finders is one of the platforms and uh, traveling nurses. So you got a question on midterm rentals. Right. Cause yes. So we plan on, like, we fixed our basement apart. Well, it was a regular mm -hmm. long-term basement. Now it's going to be a midterm rental. I, I love that one. We will talk after. It's a slightly different play. And the setup is, is different. It's a different niche on mid midterm rentals. But we can talk. We can go deep on that one as well. So who else has questions about investing in short-term rentals? I'm assuming lots of people. That's why we're here, right? Yes. How do you know if it's a, you're going to get like a good return on your investment? Like, What's a good number? How do you know if it's going to get a return? I love that. Good. We're going to hit that too. So we're going to go through some numbers there. So how, how do we know? What about a theme, right? Is that going to be effective? And the answer is yes. A theme, a theme is tremendous. Most places don't have a built-in theme, right? You can't just do a log cap layers in it and throw it up on there and it should get some kind of return. You actually are like trying to turn a house into something exciting. So we're we're unique here and there's a kind of a built-in theme for us that people default to. Anybody see that Dolly Parton themed Airbnb? Did you see that one? Yeah. Yes. Abby, don't act like you're not excited about it. You were super excited about it. Come on. There is a Dolly Parton themed Airbnb, y'all. Put some respect on her name. It's the patron saint of East Tennessee. I got a Dolly Parton license plate. I'm not even joking. She's the biggest employer in Sevier County. Yeah. My, my little girl has books for her because that imagination library. Yeah, that's a great theme. That thing should crush. You know, she has the highest Q rating of anybody in the world, the highest popularity rating. Do you think that might be a good theme? You think it might book up? Yes. Yes, that person's a genius, and we were talking about it because you're like, someone should do that. I think you wanted to do one, right? Yes, I have a goal of wanting to have a bachelorette themed um, Airbnb sometime. Ooh. So you want a bachelorette themed Airbnb? Yes, a bachelorette themed Airbnb. I have a lot of girlfriends that um, they all want to come here to have their little trips. We've even had um, somebody that he knew from um, actually living in London came here to Tennessee to have her bachelorette party. So we're just a very big hub for that. So, yes. And as someone who sells houses here, storytelling is important, right? Absolutely. Tell people why this stuff matters. Yeah. Awesome. So we're going to run through. I just want to take a break. Anybody else have more questions? Anything to make sure we hit? Yeah, Walla. Um, numbers compared to long term. Ooh. When you know, just because you want a short term, you should run the numbers against long term. I just ran one for my house with multiple <laughs> with multiple professionals, uh, management companies, and the numbers. I would lose so much more money if I do it short term. Or that's why that sound clip came. Yeah. I don't need any. Like, no, I don't need a short term. Long term, long term. Yeah. Yes. So, no, no. So it's not, it's not about the it's about the final the money. I mean, yes. you're here for the money, not for. Well, I want a short term. It's about the money. So. Yeah. Or sometimes I want a short term because I want a vacation home and I'm looking to mitigate, right, the cost of owning one of those, which is how a lot of this started in the first place, right? It wasn't necessarily a business model. It was almost a spinoff of timeshares. Originally, there's a lot of people that were buying. I wouldn't want to speak to proportions because I'd be speaking, you know, I don't think I could say that. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? as an authority, but I certainly would say from watching the market over there, I, w I was talking to more people that were looking for that as a vacate. There was going to be some personal use associated with it. It was a second home and a short-term rental, more than just pure short-term rental investors. That has been a difference I've seen 
over the last five years of, of more pure short-term rental investors. Um, or they were, they owned the first one as a vacation, they built a portfolio, but it wasn't just me like selling it to a financial planner that never came here. And they're spending over two and a half million. That was a new phenomenon. Yeah, Pete. So, so talking about the theme, um, Airbnbs, our lodge has suites that are all themed. With themed, it's very important that you market it correctly. If you don't market it, nobody's gonna know what you're yes. getting into. So it's very important you, you get that marketing there if, if you're a themed place. Good, so I'm gonna go back to this. So right now we're talking about theme, we're talking about numbers. Let's run through some of the categories really fast so we can tie back in. Yes, another, another question or comment? I've got um, an inside, and I, I'm just want to get some feedback on this. I've got an inside on buying a used uh, airliner, and I was thinking about doing an Airbnb out of a, you know, like a Allegiant jet. Big old jet. And I was just wondering what. There's one in gas station that has one out in front of it like they're doing one. Yeah, there's one in the highway. If I can make a suggestion, I would go with Pan Am or TWA, (laughs) something a little slightly more sexy than Allegiant, but I love where your head is at. Yes. No, I'm saying the Allegiant sells jet. Everybody's used to flying. Sure. Yes. Because I've got an inside on getting one stripped out. Oh, buying an Allegiant. Using it as a gotcha. Yes. Okay. Go going, for it. Going big, Jason's. I, I see you. Well, it's just something different. Yeah. I mean, yeah. my thoughts are that the aviation community is big and they have yeah. a lot of money. Just throw it up in the rooftop neck over yeah. the uh, landing area. Yeah. 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 All right. Hey, no. so do we have another? And I love that, but just for the sake of clarity. Do we have questions? If you have comments, there's tons of stuff we're going to go into where these comments will make logical sense for everyone to track along. Um, but yeah, do we have any questions? Yes. So what are the most common complaints with Airbnbs? What are the most common complaints with Airbnbs? From the guests. Okay. Gotcha. So we'll talk about that under customer. I'm just going to rip. You have a question that's not addressed up there. Yeah. So one of my concerns would be having a great property, but then getting stuck on Page four or five. Having a great property, but be, but not being able to market it to where you're in the first couple of pages to where people don't even see your house. Because I'm I mean I'm just wondering if anybody has that experience to where, you know, you're you're not getting the hits because you don't have the SEO, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So. Rob Chavez, our, our partner and great founder, says there are spaceships in Arizona. I'm actually going to, to Roswell, staying in an Airbnb for a bachelor party because we want to believe, right? I'm trying to have a close encounter. The, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, let's run through these and we'll, we'll, get, we'll hit all those. Those are great sure. questions. So we're going to talk about marketing. We're going to talk, which is going to phase in the theme, both like right the presentation and then the execution of that on the back end. And we're also going to discuss numbers yeah. and comparing those to other, other properties. Yeah, for sure. So what are things to research, Corey? Yeah. Top things, your really top four things you're running to hit, just knowing your area, right? Researching your competition, really studying your customer, like who is this person that's actually gonna stay at this place? And then just lastly, the, really the property itself. And it should go in that order of breakdown, like understanding really your area, what does my actual competition really look like in this space? Who is gonna really come stay here because you, you don't want to look for something that fits all, but there's also riches in the niches just the same, right? So lastly in there, uh, diving into the area, looking at things that are going to be relatively close, close enough access to airports, recommend 30, no more than really 40 minutes away from any airport destination, looking for attractions and activities that are already there. That could include uh, indoor, indoor activities or theme parks, as well as things like Great Smoky Mountain National Park, where people come to love hike, camp, fish, just enjoy the outdoors. Yeah. And you've got options. I wish uh, Savannah Fike is not here tonight. She's got some in um, Newport, some of these random places where she was renting out short-term rentals uh, that were very effective. So it's not just the Smokies there. It is just what's the area there. Maybe I'm going to the Obed. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm down in Vonor. Well, but I need to become an expert on how my marketing, you know, right, like fishing and that sort of area. 
Yeah, Vernon. We got some near Windrock that do really well. Oak Ridge. Yep. Yeah. So well. Vernon's saying Windrock, right? If you're not familiar. Windrock. Windrock is an all-terrain vehicle, an off-road destination. It's a national destination. Yes, they do crush out there, out in that Oak Ridge, Harriman area. Windrock is another one. Someone called me. They're supposed to build a speedway out there by Crossville. Yeah. And he was looking to do Flat like a, a themed area being be in conjunction with yeah. the, the speedway. We were looking out there. Also an area pretty rural, like less likely maybe to run into some of the restrictions you're getting in a metropolitan area as long as your neighbors don't have a problem with it, right? Yeah, that's like deep Roan County. That's pretty, uh, yeah. pretty loosey-goosey out there. But and cleaning services, right? There's that balance of like, where am I going to find this? Is now a good time to talk about the Golden Triangle? We could dive into it a little bit. Yeah. So anybody interested in glamping? Can we take a little detour into glamping for a second? Is that cool with everybody? Yeah. So there's a guy, Kai Andrew. Go check him out. Rob had him come talk to all the community leaders. All he does is glamping. So his model was, and I think the revenue's probably gone up. He wanted to have six properties, and each property was generating $6,000. He was clearing $6,000 from each of his properties. Right, so what he did was, hey, for area, I'm looking at a golden triangle. So he wanted to be within some outdoor destinations and also close to downtown. So think like South Knoxville, Seymour, that area, right? You can access the urban wilderness, but you can also get out and go downtown or to the breweries on Severe Avenue, right? Or get down to Maryville. So you're not too far out in the middle of nowhere where you can't go and get a good meal, go to a bar, something like that but you can also do these outdoor because you get a different kind of a, a niche. You want, what he's going after is that kind of adventure traveler who's, who's down for the novelty of this. And then on glamping, what he says, you can go ahead and you can get agricultural zoning, right? Prefer to buy something that already has one structure in place and then you run stub outs. And as long as the property is not physically attached on agricultural zoning, you can pretty much do whatever you want. You can park a bunch of Airstreams on it and it's fine. Right? So he'd run these stub outs and he would do a mix of yurts and A-frames and maybe like an, an Airstream. He'd break those up because of sound. You don't want 10 cent, 10 cent. So he's mixing that up and then building some common areas. So that's what he did to, to build those out. There's someone here. I always forget the name. Who's the guy that's got the Conestoga luxury wagons? Remember that one, Corey? Oh, man. What does that do? Came to our open house. I'll find it. I got his card someplace. We'll, we'll share it. Jasmine, Yeah. So glamping is going to be uh, glamorous camping, luxury, luxury camping. So if you've seen those domes or anything like that, right, it's, it's I want to have that experience, but I also want to be able to go to a hot shower. So when I stayed in those yurts, they had that sort of like campground style common shower there. And then, you know, there was a common uh, multiple fire pits located around there, right? There's, which is cool. I ended up meeting a really nice family, hanging out with them. So it was, it was a bit of experience like I was going camping without like just totally – Roughing, roughing it. it. Yeah. Sleeping yeah, on yeah. dirt. Exactly. And sometimes I'm gonna sleep, it's I'm gonna sleep on a bed in the woods. <laughs> those domes or those little they're A-frames? Sweet. Yeah. They're they are pretty sweet. Yeah, they're sweet for sure. You're sleeping on a bed? You're bringing yeah. a cot with you? <laughs> the, um, anyway, diving into it a little bit further. <laughs> I have a uh, just saying. So competition, Corey. Competition. Let's talk about how do we research how do we research so before we move on from area totally, right? We're in an area that is really ideal in a lot of ways. Um for short-term rentals. We've got some metro areas. They'd be effective. You could do it in Chattanooga if the zoning permitted. You could do them here. There are some destinations. But how do you, let's say I found an area that I like, what do I do to research the competition? And I wish, where's Nathan hiding? Nathan is a, is a wizard at this. He's always talking about this. Did he disappear, Henry? Yeah. Listen, this is like eight mile. You get one shot. Sit up front so I can call you out, guys. Okay? Go ahead. No. Um, so in, in this, really, we're just making sure we're studying our competition. You really want to just identify how full is their calendar? What do these units really look like? What are their ratings? Huge one, right? Uh, what amenities are they offering? Do they have the pool? Do they have the arcade? Do they have something unique about it that's really got it, got it to stand out in all this. And then just really big one is just what are their price points, right? You're going to find some stuff on the lower end. You're going to find some stuff on the high end. And you're really going to look to find that, that common thread through there is going to be a good guiding number for you, we're going to get to numbers here in a minute, of how am I going to, how is this actually going to perform if I'm buying something that's that's in this kind of middle of the pack? I'm not straying too far on, on either of the extremes in there, right? Hey, Corey, on that, right, Nathan, 
If you haven't met Nathan Gort, Nathan is, is someone I talk to about this stuff. We've collaborated a bunch of times. Nathan, what's, I know you're, I mean, it's in a loving way, a nerd for this stuff when you're like digging into it, right? Um, that's why I call you about this stuff because you get excited about it. What do you do when you're researching? So everyone calls it something different. It's all the same thing. It's called the enemy approach. It's called game film. It's basically sports. You watch it your competitions, footage, you figure out what they do. Someone mentioned a bridal shower. We do it in Nashville. I have a client, he kills with it. Uh, he has a, whoever came up with niches get riches. I love that. So the biggest thing is you find what your competition's doing and you do something, one thing better. You can use Air DNA, Rabu, Virolio. There's so many sources out there, but you can't just take it at, what's it, like half full, a glass. You have to dive deep and find your competition and study it and figure out what they're doing successful, steal it and go off, which is what's called in the STR business with a lot of coaches, the waffle bar experience. So when you do that, you can separate yourself and make a lot of money, especially in the Smokies, Dolly Parton theme. Our friend does it. She kills. She found it was a niche and she kills compared to her other cabins. So study like game film, like sports, Utilize realtors, lenders, anyone in the field, and look at the competition. Because if you read the, or the comments, the comments will tell you what they do well. Steal from that. And we've got some specific examples. I got some other people in the room I want to hear from. Um, once we get to those specifics, Corey, those, ones, those case studies, mm -hmm. I think that we can have a really high-level talk on this. Yeah, 100%. 100%. So... Um, kind of going off what Nathan was just talking about, like really advertising like or identifying who your customer is. I mean, is this in a space that's popular with families, outdoor types? Am I looking for the millennial couple with disposable income who's looking for a more of a unique stay? Or am I looking for, or uh, do I have a property that might just be, quite frankly, a pad that you got some traveling seniors that just need a spot to go hook up their RV and stay for the night? Like, both are equally fine, but understanding really what's going to fit your style and what your goal is, is going to be important there. Like those two demographics are not the same and this, the strategies to approach to either of them is not going to be the same. It's not a one size fits all. My friend, who's your avatar for your place, when you're, you're, for your downtown SDR rental? Who's the avatar? Who's your customer? More than one type, so we've got some people that are looking for the urban wilderness, right? Those are going to be our our outdoor adventures. Yep. Who else? Yep. So Seth, he will come in the South Knoxville to go Baker Creek. Yep. Sure. So you're not going to be able to go into the Smokies because they're going to the Smokies. They're probably running one of the 20,000 options out there. Sure. Yeah, every once in a while, a few people are looking for a more affordable space somewhere outside of the Great Barrier. Are you getting people that are looking to, like, a downtown or coming to Knoxville, go out to some bars? Is that, like, yeah, so we get a lot like, like, a, like a city visitor? Yeah, we get a lot cool. of people that are uh, coming to meet up with friends and they're not going to the city. Yep. So, And parent, parents visiting their kids, right? That's so, a big one. Yep, that makes sense. Well, Who's your... Also, people like alumni coming to the game. Gotcha. So you, you have a lot of different customers, it sounds like, right? Yeah, I think you mentioned like six or seven different kind of customers. One last type that has actually been really successful are people shopping for real estate in Knoxville. People shopping for real estate in Knoxville. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you're getting 30 to 60 day type stays. Uh, briefly, who's your avatar in Teleco Village? Because that's a very different, right? Like, who's the customer? Who's your customer? Sorry, an, av an avatar, right, is, is like a... Sure. Yeah. So, so retirees. And they're looking for a place, uh, or sometimes, uh, oh, they're coming for a wedding, you know, it's, uh, or like right now I'm having a customer, a guest who's staying at our guest suite, um, and he's looking to 
Okay. But I would say the majority of your customers, right? If you're going after a niche, is going to be retirees, right? Right. That's who you're marketing to? Exactly. Yes. Gotcha. I try to cater retirement people. Yeah, so I don't want the you know, an eighteen year old and other people coming to party and then next thing I know, enjoy your life. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yep, so retirees are gonna be your customer. You're gonna have some outdoor adventurers and some city visitors, right? Those city visitors are gonna flow into to university. But I wanna get clear, like if I've got seven customers I'm going after, it's very hard to market, right? I could go one or two, depending on how I position my marketing, right? Like, I, that, that's something I could do. And if I had different marketing channels, or, I mean, you could have multiple if you have different marketing channels for those, right? But really, like, who's my... Because the people that are going to just need a place to stay will find it. Well, I think location is really your, your selling point. It's what are you near, and then that's what you want sure. to do. Yep. So you're, say, you're saying for for you, you're selling location. Yeah, they don't spend the day in your unit. They, they sleep there. They go out and do things. Yep. Okay. So you're you're saying you're saying lo location. Gotcha. And I think that's that's valid. Um, on here, we, we do want to look at customers because as we get into more of like where I'm looking to invest, I want to get clear. Let's say let's talk about the Smokies. Like who is my who is my customer, right? If I have a cabin that's right across the street from the island and all my marketing talks about the Smokies and hiking, that is not my customer, right? My customer are, is, depending on the size of the cabin, are going to be families, people that want those amenities. Man, I was going to, I was going to comment on that. There, there was just kind of reminded me of something we looked up not too long ago was the number of like ADU or on AD, uh, Accessibility? Yeah, thank you. That's the word. Like the, Gretchen, the number of them. Gretchen Kingma, yeah. the occupational therapist. I see you, Gretchen. Yeah, just the number of actual ones that were available out there. Like talk about a niche market. Okay, like, you want to hear something that you can print money on? Like literally print money on. This will work anywhere in the country. Anywhere in the country. And I have, if you want, Gretchen Kingma, will, you could hire her. K-I-N-G-M-A as a consultant, and she will consult on this because she's an occupational therapist. If you look up accessible Airbnbs in any market in the country, it is far less than 1%, right, are accessible, right, where zero entry. And if you look at the bookings, their occupancy is insane. It's like 90% because what do we have? We have a aging population, and there is just a giant population that is not being served of Americans just like us that have mobility issues. And this stuff is, is subtle. So that is one killer hack. It's a killer hack even if you're around here if you want to stand out from your competition. Because let's say I have large groups. Is it possible I might be bringing mom on vacation with me? Right? The family's all meeting up. I see you, Jason. Uh, the family's all meeting up. Like, I want to have something that's accessible, right? That's going to be the killer edges. Well, this one's got a zero entry. It's got, like, a ramp where we can get mom into the main level, and there's a main level bedroom, right? That other sick one we can't use. Yeah, Jason. I had a client from Nashville, and the only way he would buy He wanted to buy a rental cabin, but the only way he would buy it is if it was accessible mm -hmm. because he had a, a, a wheelchair-bound child. And the only way he would buy it, because they wanted to use it too, is if it's accessible. Let me tell you, that was very, very difficult to find. Yeah. But we did. Yeah. yeah you, had your, you had your hand yeah. raised in the back, too. Yeah, we get a lot of multi generational families at our Airbnb, and they're always asking if we have a bedroom on the main floor, which we do. Um, so that's something to consider if you're marketing to families. Mm -hmm. And getting some clarity. Why didn't we just talking about this? of what are, you know, sell some new construction out there, some of the larger cabins that are 10 bedrooms plus, like wh who is actually renting those? It is large family gatherings or it can be corporate gatherings, right? Those are two different avatars. Those are their customers and getting clear on like, if you go out there, there are some clear similarities in that customer base. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of, of who's actually renting those. I want to identify her in the back. You had your hand raised. Hey, I was just going to say that goes full circle to your 
your question about how do you get higher in the rankings on a platform like Airbnb, that's what they're getting at is if you are ADA compliant, you're gonna filter through hundreds of thousands of properties and wind up with three on your list and you'll need to go to for that specific. Got you. So she's saying that's another way to 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 stand out. What was your name? Emma. Emma, so Emma just, Emma just shared that is another way. Uh, well, she's undercover. She got the hat on, Nathan. Uh, I, I see you, Emma. Now, now, I, now I get it. Um, that is another way to stand out from the niche in terms of SEO, right? It might not immediately SEO. What it will do, though, is, is a filter. It's going to immediately stand you out. Like So having a category that no one else is in, if you're playing with those filters in Airbnb, would work out. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. It's cool. I'm going to move on. We have more questions after yeah. just to run through these. I want to get to the case studies. Sorry, hitting a couple of these. Right. So just uh, lastly, just number four, there's just the property itself, right? Making sure that it matches the demographic that you're going after. Don't buy a condo in an area where cabins are popular. Maybe a hot take on that one. Um, if the competition has pools, right? Noting that, I mean, certainly I think in our, our market of the Smokies, you see a, a big change once you start hitting the four bedroom cabin, five bedroom cabin plus with the pool where the cabin itself is the destination. You've got families that will go and pile in there and they might not necessarily venture out because it's just there to stay, right? You got a large space that you can accommodate multiple people. Those seem to do really well. Statistically, if you look at cabins with pools, they right now are consistently in the top 10% when we're looking at these, at these sites in terms of returns right now, right? And it could just be, again, a search filter. Is everyone using that 8 by 10 plunge pool? I don't think so, but it's certainly something that you filter for. Well, this one's got a pool. Maybe the kids will stay out of our hair, <laughs> right? But they certainly seem to perform better in all the stuff that we're selling. Like pool, pools are the real big distinguishing factor. Um, it's certainly what we've been talking about with the, the new build clients we're working yeah, with. I was just going to say, like that's definitely where like new builds can actually really – help you in this space? If you're looking at short-term rentals, I highly recommend you look at new builds. If you look at a resale price per foot right now, it's like 500 a foot. If you look at new builds, I mean, even luxury builds, you're more like 300 a foot. You know, there is some sort of a bubble in that market, clearly. And I'm not afraid of buying in a bubble. I just don't want to be on the top of the bubble. I want mm -hmm. everybody in the cookie cutter paradise with, you know... <laughs> The cheesy, right? No view, totally indistinguishable. Yeah. You've got a cookie cutter uh, kit built cabin. Like those folks are going to have a hard, a hard time if they bought it recently. Yeah. Diving into it, let's just hit some numbers really quickly. Yes. This is really going to be your biggest calculator for for a lot of this, right? Is just understanding like two, one, two things. Your occupancy rate and your nightly rate. Like understanding those are going to be be hugely important. What percentage of the month can I actually expect this to be rented out? And then what is the average rate in the area? It's going to give you a quick high level view over what, what you can actually get out of this property. So, so we've got some, some experts here that got access to some data. So do you want to give us some benchmarks, Kim, on what, let's, let's talk occupancy rate at first. What's, what's a, a standard occupancy rate? Like maybe we'll talk about for like an average cabin, and then we can talk an, about an occupancy rate for the ones that seem to be doing very well. Uh, so the occupancy rate actually varies depending on um, the number of occupants that can actually occupy the home. The larger the cabin, the lower the occupancy rate, believe it or not, um, unless you have a, a, a ever-revolving door of guests that return. Um so, but the average right now is between 60 and like 75% in our market in Gatlinburg and Sevierville and Pigeon Forge. Um, I haven't ran the numbers on Norse Lake, but um, they're that's, the they're, they're about, yeah, they're about the same. She's more of the, that area than I am, so. So that's, that's one variable, right? That's our, our occupancy rate. Um, we work with a lot of clients with Vodacy. Their occupancy rate they're doing is going to be around... Uh, like a 68% is the one I see kind of plugged in, mm -hmm. right? That's what they're training people to run the numbers off of. Or you can go look at, you know, those platforms, Frolio, Rabu, AirDNA. That's another way to kind of get some averages, some benchmarks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. The, uh, the other one, there's just your nightly rate. So the formula, like looking at this overall, is just going to be you taking your, your occupancy rate 
you're multiplying that by your average nightly rate. That's going to give you an effective nightly rate. Take that number, multiply it by 365 right, days in a year. That's going to give you your, est your estimated annual growth, gross revenue on this. So let's kind of walk through an example. Like you mentioned, 75% as kind of a number to, to hit off of. So we use that in this one. So units run at 75% of the time at an average of $200 a night. So 70.75 times 200 gives me 150. Multiply that by 365. That gives me a potential of $54,750 per year of gross revenue. So if we're looking at that, that formula again, right? Our occupancy rate is 75, our average nightly rate is 200, and our effective nightly rate is gonna be that 150 number. That's the blended one there. Yep. So it, you, mentioned, you mentioned kind of AirDNA, Rabu, Vrolio was one of the other ones, right? These are all websites you can use that all compile data. Mashvisor is another one that you can use that all compile all this aggregate data from these markets all around the country that you can use to your advantage when you're running some of your numbers to see what makes sense. Obviously, I'm always going to look to defer to the experts in that space because they're going to help me go deeper on individual property bases. This math is more so for just understanding what an area market is doing, and then I'm going to go talk to an expert like a property manager, somebody in that space who can give me some more detailed clarity on that particular property itself. I have a question for, for Kim and Ashley. When we're looking at those, is your internal data matching up to what you see on AirDNA? Because I've been so curious about, here's what I think doesn't work here. You've got a ton of privately held cabins, right? I guarantee any bugs data is not anywhere it can be scraped by air DNA. You know, you got a lot of private cabins being held here. So I'm curious where that data is coming off of. You've got a lot of people that don't advertise at all on those platforms. Like their cabins are solely advertised on their individual websites, right? Their, their cabin website, Patriot getaways or something. They're not being advertised on these other sites. So that data is not being scraped off of there because I have a lot of people calling me, asking me, about that running their own numbers and their perception, you know, none of the numbers are working. And I was like, that's fascinating because, you know, all my clients are making money. They might be making their returns. Would you agree, Vernon? But like they're, it's not like no one's making money here, but when they're pulling off AirDNA or Vrolio or Rabu, I would really be leaning on the local community here. Are you seeing it higher? They're, they're seeing, seeing lower. Lower, okay. They're, they're, Sometimes, sometimes they're they're seeing lower. On what they're putting in there, sure. Sure. what they're plugging in, because air DNA is notorious for being a lot higher gotcha. than it really should be, like twenty percent higher, because they incorporate all Taxes. the fees gotcha. into yes. their actual data. They don't take it yeah, out. Let's. I'm gonna have you hold Sorry. this here. No, no, no. It's a good point. It's a good point. So. So what I said was, um, so AirDNA is notoriously higher, and a lot of other websites are too, because they don't take out the cleaning fee data, the taxes data. So they're notoriously 15 20% higher than what your local property managers would be. Um, and so we take into account that when we, we, when we derivated our numbers, we don't we, we use in-house numbers more, and if it doesn't look right, we will go outside and we'll seek out numbers from VRBO, and we, but we don't use D or DNA at all. Yeah. So, Vernon, I, I think Vernon had something yeah. you want to say. I just want to say really quickly, a lot of times um, when we're running the numbers, we're actually taking it off comparables just like you would for real estate. So whatever something is renting for in Pigeon Forge, it's four bedrooms. We're comparing it to like a mile around it in order to give you a good estimate from the comparables. So they're saying they're doing like when we talked about before doing our comps on right the the landlord side, they're doing the same thing of sense. how am I pulling comps off of that? Rate. Yes. Yeah, that makes total sense. Average daily rate. Hey Vernon. We run a low, medium and high on our comps. And you'll also find that some of these larger cabin companies that don't advertise on Airbnb and Verbo, they can bottom out some of those prices too because they have lesser overhead. They're not paying all those other fees. But on top of that, 
what we find is is that sometimes you'll get things that don't have the same amenities. Like you'll have one that's three hundred dollars a night, but it's got a pool and a pickleball or you know some yep. some really nice amenities. So you really have to go in and do like Ashley said, do the deeper dive and, and really get in there. And that's what we're that's what we're available for. My numbers always come in lower, and I got realtors calling me all the time. They're like, your numbers are so low, but I really go in and do a deeper dive. So. Get somebody like Vicasa or somebody that that does actually go in and do the deeper dive instead of just taking that that top number. Uh huh. Right. <laughs> so, because there's a couple of factors we're looking at, right? So to back this all the way back out, if anyone didn't follow what they were saying, is when we're looking at rental revenue, there's the nightly rate rental revenue, and there's also things like cleaning fees and some of those other charges. So you got to figure out like that's why. I don't want to go off just of a screenshot. I want to look at, am I comparing apples to apples? Because the numbers can look different. But if that cleaning fee is not padded, sometimes it is a source of revenue, right? You're charging a cleaning fee. There's a delta on it. You're making more than you're paying for cleaning. But if not, that's not actual revenue, right? It's a total pass-through. Depending on the pro forma, it may make sense because you got that as, I want that top-line revenue, right? Because that's an expense. One rule of thumb Nationally, if you're looking at it, is short-term rentals generally income is about 40% of revenue. I'm sorry, expenses are about 40% of revenue. Not not always. They don't always scale on some of the larger ones, but your expenses typically are 40% of revenue. Does that track with what you see, Wyatt? Wyatt is my is my go-to quant. I said, do you see like income expenses are typically 40% of revenue? Is that a good kind of baseline? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but you want to dive in and look at these numbers. Yes, I'm going to say, Emily. Uh, I've got some numbers I can share because we, we just purchased our cabin in Sevierville in April or in November, totally renovated it and started on Airbnb April 1st. And um, we're always over 80% booked. Um, we've done it mid-century modern, so it's kind of like that niche right there. Um, we stay around two, 200 a night. It's a two-bedroom Queen beds only, which is kind of disappointing not to have a king bed. But um, our numbers, I mean, we are at 36000 in just of gross. Um, so it's been really exciting to see that happen in this market when I feel like it's been a scary market. How much are you, what's, how much are you into that one for? Um, what was your purchase? Just some plus renovation. Yeah. Okay. So we, I found it on Zillow by owner. Um, he was not motivated to sell. He, it was just like a vacation home he kind of forgot about. So wrote a letter, you know, really pushed on him and he sold for 285. He had multiple offers and, um, we did like a HELOC. Our, our interest is around six something, almost 7%. And so, um, yeah, we, we did all the renovations. It was, it was, about ninety five thousand in renovations. Gotcha. So yeah. you're, it sounds like you're in about three three eighty. Three eighty, yeah. Our our yeah, our expense is kinda of high, but we're still like covering everything, which is great. Hopefully we can refinance. <laughs> and the other thing to be cognizant of when we talk about management growth of this Corey is is pricing, mm. right? Dynamic pricing. There's a pricing strategy. Like it's and the managers I see that are high level are looking at that. I don't know. Pete, do you use some dynamic pricing? Are you constantly kind of changing and shifting that, right? Yeah. So here, I'm going to give this to you. What are you seeing in terms of like last minute bookings versus immediate bookings? You know, I know that's, that's changed and there's a strategy to leaving some vacancies in your, right? Because those, those can be higher revenue. There's a balancing act there. Yeah, so my cabins are mostly last minute because they're honeymoon style cabins, couples, mainly couples only, no kids. Um, so mine are mainly seven days, 14 days. So I'm not too bothered if everybody's screaming that they don't have two months out, they don't have bookings or something. Ours is a week, two weeks, but we just use dynamic pricing. So we don't have to worry about changing and keep up with events and stuff like that. And for anyone who's new, we're talking about dynamic pricing. So think of like any sort of like surge-based pricing, like Uber uses dynamic pricing, right? As, dyna as demand increases, pricing increases. So there's a balancing act. If I've booked out my entire calendar in March, I may have fumbled the bag, right? I didn't ask for enough. We were just talking, um, Wyatt and I worked on a deal together, both represented the buyer together. Um, and they said, hey, the clientele that we were getting weren't worth it at that price point we increased our price point, which I'm sure had some effect 
on their occupancy, but they were more satisfied with the clientele that they were getting. So this is, this is not just a, a short topic. We can kind of deep on this, right, in terms of how you're managing, how you're presenting. So, which goes to say management matters. Yeah, absolutely. Management matters, right? Can you do this yourself? Like, absolutely. You can totally manage it yourself. There's plenty of ways and tools and systems out there that you can automate a lot of this to a degree, right? I would say there's a big but there and that you will need to be available to handle any of those uh, emergencies that come up, oversee turnover, cleaning. That's super, super important. Maintenance, supplies, restocking. I mean, if you're really trying to do all that on your own, that is a that is a full-time commitment at that point. Like that is not a passive investment strategy at all. So management matters. I would defer just go hire the right management. Let them take it over for you. Before we move on, because we still have to hit most common complaints and some some remarks on theme. Any questions on on numbers? Uh, yeah, Dominic. Question. So, um, as far as like the house cut between uh, the difference in fees, not the cleaning fees and the taxes, that's all top of the line stuff, but the difference in like cut from Airbnb, Airbnb versus Verbo, like what do those percentages look like that they take for the use of that, their platform? And who's the cheapest? <laughs> so I cannot answer, right? In terms of, so yes, you got some, would you know competition in terms of the platforms? Yes. Airbnb is cheap. Airbnb is I think they're about 3%. 3%. And then Vorbo. Airbnb is 3%. Vorbo is, depends. If you have your own credit card where you take your own credit cards. Stripe. If you have Stripe with Vorbo where you're taking your own payments, then Vorbo is 5%. If not, if you have Vorbo take credit cards, then it's 8%. So either way, it's the, it's the same. Get on more platforms. Good, Ashley. Yeah. Here, what's that? I was just saying, if you can get on more platforms, get on more platforms. I think Guesty is one that will manage several different platforms, and it just it pays for itself. Yeah. One of the things to be aware of, right? We're talking about management. Would you rather pay twenty percent with no marketing budget, or twenty five percent with the five percent marketing budget? Take Which are you going to make more money on, guys? I see Vernon smile. What do you think? Me. If you really want to make passive income, putting somebody else's hands is what they're doing. Yeah. That's so, yeah, right? Like, it's not, it's not always like you get what you pay for. Right. I say this as a realtor. Like, fantastic. The model should work, like, for a discount brokerage, putting it in the MLS or something. But you see kind of like, oh, awesome. There's no threat there because the service delivered just doesn't seem to work often, Right. So I'd say the same there of just getting kind of clear. And really I'd say it's probably like looking at other people, talking to management companies and seeing, can I talk to other people and what are their returns? You know, from before these platforms existed, we're agents to go back to like, we're not experts on anything. I can't run pro formas for people. So therefore I've got to have relationships with property managers. And I was like, talk to these three and see what you think. And there's wisdom in crowds. Yeah, Vernon. Something else people don't factor in. Software costs money. Guesty, Hostway, all those costs money. Dynamic pricers cost money. All these things you're talking about, the management company has at their disposal. So what Vernon is talking about economies of scale. So he's saying that software costs money, dynamic pricing costs money, right? Some of this marketing can cost cost money. It's the same thing, I think, when we're selling selling homes, right? It's like anything else I have relation to this is like, there is an upfront base level cost and it doesn't increase if I'm doing this for 40 properties or for two properties, but it can be a high level of entry to do it all yourself. Yes. Uh, one of the benefits of going with a bigger, sorry. One of the benefits of going with um, a professional management company is that we have created relationships with these platforms where we're able to give you it at a, f a different rate than what you would if you signed up for each of them individually. So like a bigger platform like Vacasa, we can give it to you at a at a much cheaper <laughs> rate, pass-through rate than you would get signing up for each of them individually. Sure. Like for instance, we can we do it on like 45 different booking platforms. So yeah. and you get it at a a minimal cost. So yeah. 
No, that's right. So it just kind of hits on that, right? Economies of right. scale. Right. Remember, this is all hospitality, yeah. right? Um, invest in good management. Right? Professional management is going to come at a cost. We're seeing out, upwards of around 20, 30 percent of gross rents, depending on what they're managing, maybe how many throughout that process. So, but they're going to be able to help assist with all that cleaning, getting reviews, pool and hot tub maintenance, incident response, right? Huge one right there. Just when something does go wrong, the responsiveness to it all, repairs, photography, the marketing end of it, like just investing in good management is just that. It's an investment. Yeah, Pete. So just if, if you're thinking about short-term rental purchasing, a lot, lot of new new people forget to add the property management costs in there. So you, you've got to factor the 20, 25% or 30% in there because that will make a huge difference in your numbers. I mean, huge. So just remember to add those in there. And there are a lot of mismanaged properties. Any realtors in here selling cabins? Yeah? How many, how many cabins, right? Is that what we're selling, right? It's like, oh, if, if someone else comes in and manages it correctly, it can do X, right? Exactly. There's also money can be made just by switching them. So um, price is what you pay. Value is what you get. Would it be helpful for anyone to have a really detailed spreadsheet that breaks down all these expenses for you that you can just fill out? Yeah? Awesome. So Abby and Wyatt have one. I told you Wyatt is my secret weapon. I will send that to everybody that signed up there, right? Uh, so you have a copy of it so you can use it. Thank you, Abby, so much. I appreciate that. This thing is awesome. Like it goes in, you can go really, really deep on this and, and run in some numbers. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah really appreciate that. That's awesome. That's a big one. Remember, this is a big one, right? We just talked about, talked about this earlier. Just remembering you have to market. You have to showcase this property. Investing in good photography. Like good marketers really know that you're grabbing like attention and engaging, pe engaging people's emotions, right? You're selling a vacation here. You're not selling like the house, you got to get people invested in this space uh, to want to come and book it, to come pay three, four, five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars plus a night. Right? You're selling an experience, and so marketing matters. I mean, really, uh, the pros that we're really seeing that are doing it at a high level are bringing in actors, models could be themselves, really, right? But they're showcasing like people enjoying the space to help really set that stage. And by doing so, that can and will pay dividends like over time, like investing in the right marketing on the front end is gonna be a massive, massive game changer for you. Are our case studies next? Is that what's coming next? Are, absolutely. All right, so to answer your question about themes, sir, what was your name? Barry. Barry, so you had a question about theme. Yes, theme can crush. It is, I think, in my opinion, one of the most underused concepts here locally, right? And then if you want to go look at where it does do really well, go to Florida and look at Reunion. Reunion is a vacation rental community right outside of Kissimmee. And you're going to see themed ones that have, right, uh, the Hogwarts Express in the middle of it, themed bedrooms, like you, everything you can imagine, because you've got a variety of intellectual property there. It is themed. They do perform really, really well. If I was going to buy just a kind of mid-level cabin, I would go back and like, why do you not have a themed kid's bedroom? You know what I mean? Why are you buying? I'm not going to throw them on the bus, but you know, some of these posters I see, like your movie theater room has like, you're paying $300 for a reprint. Of, I don't know. Uh, there's some, you have the same exact furniture as everybody else and the same exact floor plan as everybody else and the same exact neighborhood as everyone else. That's, that's not, you know, you're not setting yourself apart. There's not a lot to market off of that. Uh, was it Sean? Were you asking about marketing? Yeah, so there are some resources you can look at. Uh, we have a client, Josh Lehu, that runs 5 STR Guestbook. And what he does, we had a great conversation. He was talking to me about this, was there's a couple of different things when you're buying the property, right? There's the acquisition of the property. There's the setting up of the property. That in and of itself is a whole class of like, how do you set that thing up where it has the things that you would want if you were in an Airbnb? Like that from talking to the people, talk, mo common complaints, like, oh, I wouldn't know that I've hadn't talked to someone else that this is a common request. This is a common issue that occurs there. Um, then there is the presentation of the property, right? And the experience. And so for him, the experience is going to someplace like Townsend, where Pete is in, like, hey, do I have some relationships 
with river rats and some of the other ones there and some information there when they come in, right? I've created some sort of affiliate experience. And then how am I marketing that? Doing video marketing is one of the things like some SDR, I think some of the That's management nice. companies here could talk about what that looks like. Let's talk about these case studies, Corey, because yeah, this sure. is, this is, we're going to show you, not tell you. Yeah, this is definitely where it stands out. So this is one of our case studies, right? Uh, this is out in Joshua Tree, California. This has got a 4.9 star rating, 314 reviews. This is the highest, the 10th highest revenue generating property in the area, right? And so they've done well with just some of their photography that you would normally see in most real estate photography. And this is where it starts to really kind of get engaging is now adding people to the mix, right? Like showcasing people in the home, enjoying it, cooking a meal, right? Uh, shots of outdoor hammocks, seating areas to how would it feel to just chill in the hammock, right? You can kind of imagine yourselves in these spaces, killer hot tub overlooking the mountains in the desert. Like you can more easily imagine yourself in the space by seeing other people enjoying the space versus like if that was just selling like real estate, right? That would just be a picture of a deck and a hot tub. But by like adding people to the mix, you're now invoking most people can imagine what it's like to be, to be in those spaces. If you're using the photos from the MLS, you're doing it wrong. You're not selling a house. We do those to sell houses, right? You're selling an experience. And how do they sell experiences to us? Anybody get tagged into Biltmore? Last year, I get them seasonally, like over and over again. Anybody get that campaign? Is that my only one? Oh, my God. It's, but it's over and over again. It's like, here's this experience. Here's people doing this. Here's what it means. There's a theme to it, right? Like, here's how you, what, let's imagine how your family will feel. Right. We know how they're going to feel. Your kids are going to be cranky. They have too much sugar. They're going to be screaming. But it's going to be like, no, we're going to have this incredible bonding moment at Dollywood, you know, when it's 90 degrees outside. Like, <laughs> and, and you buy it. You're like, oh, yeah, this is going to be fantastic. And then you get there and you're like, I damn it. I forgot what was happening here. <laughs> Can you tell I grew up going to Disney? Yeah. yeah. So right. that's that's that. Any any comments? Would you all go stay in this one? That? Yeah. Anybody excited to go to Joshua Tree now? I didn't think I was until I saw this. This is sick. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really cool, like, just style and design, really marketing. Tell me property. about this local one, bro. Yeah, so this is a cool one, right? This is right here in our backyard. This is here in Sabinville, Ooh. Tennessee. This is the Skywalk Tree House. You can find it on find it on Airbnb. How much is that per night? Five-star rating, $1,117 per night. This is four, this is like four micro cabins set up with bridges between it's like set into the trees really 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 cool property but again they've done a really great job at setting the stage paint really painting the picture of what it's like to stay here oh 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 shit okay sorry oh there we go it's too good. Yep, it's we can't, too good. We can't, you can't see you. it. You can't, you don't know. You we don't know, show you right? This. Um, but they just do a really, really great job here of. Let's go, let's go back to this one here. Yeah. This lifestyle shot. So what's, what's your, what's your takeaway, right? Like what's the, what's the, what's the customer they're looking for there, right? It's family friendly, right? Affluential, you know, we all want to be affluential based on all the marketing we get all the time, right? Going back to the friends living in a gigantic, unrealistically big apartment, right? This is on us all the time. Mm -hmm. The lighting, right, Corey? Yeah. It's a mood for sure. Yeah, it looks cozy and warm, right? It's private. Private, yeah. But if it was, it could look barren, sterile, empty, right? The lighting and the people create this warm, inviting environment. Yeah, I mean, they took these pictures like more so in like the winter. Like there's mm -hmm. no like leaves on the trees, but it's still like... Probably because the foliage would have just blocked it out. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to see it. Like it'd be great to be there with the canopies full, but you wouldn't be able to actually see the property if it's in the middle of all the streets. Mm -hmm. So they went with the lights, right, to highlight that. Like, okay, we're going to be shooting in the winter. We're going to use these lights, create this warm. Would you want to go stay there on a on a warm on a on a cold winter night? Right? Yeah, it looks dope. Yeah. There we go. That yeah, worked good. Um, right, just done a really really good job setting the stage, really painting that picture for enjoying to stay there. And let's talk about the customer there, right? Who's, who's the customer? It could be large groups that are running out the, the entire thing. It could be what you have in the Smokies is families or multiple families coming to the same place. 
and we see that play in something like this with the micro cabins, or we see it in the larger cabins where you have like the bunk rooms, right? We're gonna bring all of our kids together. Yeah. I'm gonna have to stay in my room with my partner. He's gonna stay in his room with his wife. But oh, we can throw all the kids in together, right? And that's the model too. When we're thinking about how to set this up or how to run these. True. Like who's our ideal customer? Yeah, and dividing it out if you've got like a large group, thousand bucks, eleven hundred, sure. Or they might be looking just for that smaller, more affluent family that is looking for just a really nice, unique, quiet, private stay in the mountains and a thousand bucks a night. Sure. Let it roll. Yeah. So we talked about multi-channel, which Kim just talked about, right? That you want to try potentially multiple platforms to stay booked. So if you're self-managing, we mentioned a couple of hosting platforms or working with somebody that has multiple channels, right? That is going to do the self-management plays you might do but also have their own platform marketing on your behalf. Mm -hmm. Those are big ones. Yes. We already yeah. talked about dynamic pricing, so I think we can skip over this. Sure. Here we go. Big one. What are, let's, let's wrap this up. What are our most common complaints that you get if you own short-term rentals? I'm gonna go right here. We'll knock out a bunch from here between Kim, Ashley, and Vernon, and then we can fill these in. Cleaning is the member say, one. Say it again. Cleaning, clean homes, clean, like people will pull back furniture just to tell you it's not clean. Did y'all hear that? People are on vacation, moving the couch, right? So cleaning, cleaning, what, what, did, what did we miss, Vernon? What's, what else do you get? An amenity that they didn't know about that's not working. Yeah. They, oh. they put their whole trip around that hot tub and yeah. for, that, for some reason it's broken that day. The amenities not working, hot tubs, or you know, you put the sick arcade machine in, but now it's not working and it's ruined the whole vacation, right? Yep, yep. I had a great Airbnb with a sick Viking stove, and I was like, you need to put a QR code there with the video of how to use this because it's broken every month because no one knows how to work a work a gas stove. They have no idea how to use it. What what else? Fireplaces. What else? Fireplaces? Yeah, one hundred percent. Oh, the drive up, yes. A sheet describing how to work the TV. I've been in a lot of Airbnbs and they got like four or five remotes and it's like, what is what? Is what? You know, it's something so simple as a sheet of paper laminated explaining what remote does what. I mean, that makes all the difference in the world because, you know, you get some older people in there and get flustered real easy and it ruins the experience. Yeah. Any other really common complaints from our, our short-term rental hosts that we've heard? Slow internet. Slow? Slow internet. Yeah, that's a big one. Slow internet, yeah. Slow internet, lack of signal, mm -hmm. right? Man, I haven't talked to my kids in three years. They live on their tablets. There's no signal here. This is miserable, right? <laughs> uh, no, no, I mean, it's a bonding experience yeah. for all of us, hopefully. Right. <laughs> I don't, uh, yeah, but it's, uh, understand it in that, right? Stuff's going to get broken. Yes, Corey. Right? Yep. Guess we are going to make complaints. Nobody's perfect. Even, I mean, your, your five-star review people that are totally, like, still knocking it out of the park are having guests that have bad experiences out there. What they've really mastered is being able to either be anticipatory of it Right, knowing that there might be a challenge that we can just address this on the front end with somebody before they discover that uh, that the fireplace is broken or the hot tub is out or something along those lines, being like anticipatory or just are super responsive to the complaint and go above and beyond to improve the guest experience overall. And that's why they still keep their five-star ratings. I like that. So knowing your dispute arbitration resolution process, right? Because if there's a chargeback or something, also, why uh, we got to have reserves for this, right? I was, you might not always get paid immediately, right? Might, the money might get tied up. The other thing to be aware of is if I own one cabin and there's an issue with the plumbing or the road's frozen over or the pool's not working and you're planning on coming, I ruined your vacation. One advantage in working with the management company is they don't always care if the management company is able to move them to another property. And I'm still gonna be able to keep my rating, right? Hey, thank you, so it didn't work, but Corey and Justin were, were really good. They got us moved into another place, they checked on us. You know, 
we got to have our vacation. Man, I wish we could have stayed there, right? But they're not leaving me a one-star rating because I ruined their their trip. Yeah, does, that, does that check out, you guys? Yeah. yeah. I wish Adrian Hall was here. Like, I was just talking with him. Like, he had a wild experience at, one, at his cabin where uh, guests had checked in, water heater downstairs broke, leaked water all throughout the floor. Got under all the flooring, really just not only, like, really wrecked the guest experience, but then also, like, had to file a homeowner's insurance claim to, to boot on that, right? And I remember what Adrian and Jay did, like, Drove over there, helped get everybody get their stuff squared away, put them in a hotel, covered the hotel costs, like for moving them all, right? Just went above and beyond to address the issue and make it right as best they could, given that circumstance. Um, And the one big thing I think that would, the two big ones are going to be plumbing and AC. Mm -hmm. It's the same as if you're, you know, a regular landlord. What are the two big emergencies you got to go over there to fix? When one of the things I did like when Kai Andrew was talking about his glamping is he wanted to have more consolidated. And what he made sure was that he had extra. Hey, I've got an extra mini split and I've got right some backups there. So if something goes out, generator, whatever, I can come in there and get this online. And that's how I run that. I have a handyman there, but I can just swap it out. So they're not without AC. I got a portable AC or something like that. So having those in. Those are probably the biggest, That's most right. common ones. That's right. Yeah, like the window units, like set in like a storage shed, like off to the side, but yes. like in a pinch, go pull one of those out, exactly. throw a window unit in, and cool, we got AC. So yeah, but cleaning, cleaning, cleaning. And if you'll notice when we talked about that, like and good cleaners was part of the area. If you do not have good cleaners, you cannot run a short-term rental business, period, right? Think about Think about hotel experiences, right? Anybody stay? Am I the only one that likes a, likes a good budget hotel? I can go without amenities, but I need it to be clean. Yeah. Like if I'm just going to sleep there, to, to your point, just right about, hey, you're really just there to stay there. But if it's clean, I'm good, right? I got a bed. The bed was clean. It was simple. If it's not clean, then I'm like creepy crawly, getting the black light. I would say that applies night. across the board, no? Because we've sold like 70s time capsules that need full like renovation, like updates. But if it's clean and it's presentable. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I'd say bad. the same. It was one of my, one of my tricks when I was selling cars and stuff too, right? Yeah. Just I'm selling, deep clean to use asset is just clean the thing. Yeah. Just de- super detailed, deep clean. It will make all the, will make all the difference in the world. And be unique. We've talked about this a couple different ways, right? If you could choose, do we pick the unique experience or do we pick when we're, sh- we're looking at Airbnbs, are you going for the familiar or are you going for the unique how many people are going for the familiar? How many people are going for the unique, right? If I'm going for the familiar, what am I looking at? I want to go to Double Tree because I know I'm going to get the cookies and I know what it's like, right? And I'm, I'm used to that service. All things considered, I want, the, I want the unique experience when I'm staying in an Airbnb. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, man. Cool. Corey, take it. You're the serious guy. I am super serious. Uh, <laughs> Right. But, but take it seriously, right? This is very much an investment. Again, this is hospitality at its finest. So investing in good furniture and good design, having rules and standards in place, measure and track what works, right? What seasonality ran? Did I run this promo? Did I have anything? Like seeing what the competition's doing, doing tracking that. Always then take what the competition's doing and find a way to to plus that, make that experience that's, a little bit that's better. That's our waffle bar strategy. If anyone's looking yeah, for something was- to... To Google later, right? Where you can find some content. It's a waffle bar strategy. Yep. This is really your, your ability to succeed is really going to depend on on that. Your ability to stand out, like be unique enough to attract enough people coming to stay there, and then still maintaining that five star experience. Again, four point seven or less is just not acceptable. You're not even in the game. And those platforms, from what I understand, will also start like aggregating your listing further and further down the list based on how those reviews come in. So you truly do like live or die based on how those reviews show up. Tell me about why you think it might be important to not only have the right property, but have the right design and the right furnishings. I think it's kind of related to, we talk about the cleanliness thing, like the respect people put into things. Yeah. Yeah. If you've, if you've got, if you're putting out a nice, place that's well taken care of and has great design and style and has well-made furniture. It's not just stuff ordered off of, I don't know, Wayfair, 
Target, Amazon, whatever, like going and buying like sturdy, solid stuff is going to be appreciated by people staying there. And it's going to save you cost in the long run because if you're spraying it on like the cheap furniture with the amount of traffic that you're inevitably getting through these properties, it's going to break. And then you're going to have the complaint that the couch just totally fell apart or something like that. What would you have to say? Oh, great question. No, I love that. So your question was, how do I go about furnishing the property? Would I tie it into the loan? So you can't get a mortgage on, on furniture, right? Furniture can only be on an asset. But somehow, all the furniture in every one of these cabins is worth $1, right? On a, on a, as an amendment there. So usually here, they all come furnished. If they don't, if you're purchasing new, what they can do is a seller could work in a furnishing allowance. So like a seller could, out of their proceeds at closing, have a check for a furnishing allowance. If that can't go directly to you, it could go to a third-party vendor. Like sellers can, in transactions, pay third parties. Let's say we're doing something and I have to fix the windows or something, right? Well, I'm going to pay at closing out of my proceeds. The window people are going to work with me. Same thing. At closing, we're going to have a credit to a local furniture company or to a local designer that you can use for furnishing your property. Yeah. There's also so there's some that everyone uses, which is, is perhaps good because they're convenient. The challenge is everyone uses them. So you see the same things over and over again. Um, so that can be design is a competitive edge. Yeah. yeah. Take yeah. that take that credit and then also go hire a designer to help pick all that stuff for you. Like, yeah. I don't get lost in the weeds on that stuff. No. I'll let a designer pick everything. We work with a luxury builder and that luxury builder not only produces a great product, so he's using, let's say, for example, fiber cement siding instead of a kit, so it doesn't have to get stained every 12 years, but also they furnish the property as well. They have a designer and the, and the, the furnishings are luxury as well. So the package is set apart. Does that make sense? Like set it, set it and forget it. And when you're selling those things, it sells better when it's furnished. People want to turn key. So what are some resources, Corey? Yeah. Some other resources. Ooh. Some of these we touched on. All right, look up Kai Andrew. Great YouTube channel. All about uh, diving into kind of the land hacking strategy re regarding short-term rentals. Rob Built, a.k.a. Rob Abusolo. He's the, also the co-host of Bigger Pockets. Made a big name for himself just in the short-term rental space. Has some property actually out here in Sevierville, Gatlinburg. He's got a number of stuff out that way. Um, great resource overall to dive into. There's a couple of good books to really like hit on. It's like Optimize Your BNB, The Definitive Guide to Ranking Number One in Your Airbnb Search. Um, websites like AirDNA, MASH, Pfizer, Rolio, Rabu. These are going to be those websites that aggregate all that data for you. So when you're looking for that average nightly rate and what's the occupancy status in here, you can go onto these websites and you can pull that. Some of that you can pull for free. They do have some features as well where you can pay uh, for a specific town, county, state, national, global level, but also the price is going to scale from there as well on those. I would look at sharing some logins because it gets pretty steep. <laughs> yep. The old just, Netflix strategy. Yeah, very much. <laughs> collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Yeah. So, Corey. Yeah, split the cost, right? Um, great book. We picked up a couple here to, to build a giveaway. Short-term rental, long-term wealth, your guide to analyzing, buying, and managing vacation properties. How are we giving these away? Are we going to Karnak? Like, <laughs> think of what I'm thinking there. Are we going to... Oh, little... thanks to people for participating. Who traveled the furthest? Actually, yeah. that's one of my favorite questions to know. Is like, who traveled the furthest? Who thinks they traveled the furthest to get here? Okay. Where'd you come from? <coughs> Where at? Pigeon Forge. Bacon, South Carolina. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Back. See. All right. All right. So. Yeah. We've got, why don't you give this to somebody that you know, right? Yeah, thank you from Pittsburgh. Appreciate you coming all the way out. Thanks for coming out. Steve coming here from Macon. Steve, remember, is looking for, for property. He's looking to partner with somebody. All right, who else? Go? What were your questions? What do you like? A pick who built here. All right, all right. So who's, who's here for the first time? All right. 
Fan, fantastic here for the first time. I'm going to give one to Wyatt for sharing this this spreadsheet with all of us, right? Thank you very much. We appreciate you. Wyatt loves attention. Um, uh, all of us, all of us introverts, forced into like having to talk to people to make money. Um, all right, all right. Who else? How about most interesting thing? You know, I, I, appreciate I that see up. where your little boy works the refs from. I get it. I get it. He's a natural salesman, too. I love it, Jason. Yeah, yeah. I love it. <laughs> um, yeah, here you go. I know you'll make good use of it. Who had a ton of value here? You know what? I want to thank Vernon for coming out here. Not that you added a ton, too. Thank you so much. appreciate you coming here and being a great supporter. Yes. All right. You give someone in the room then. Let's throw this thing out here. All right. Who is, who's the youngest in here? What's that? This, yes. Way, way to work. I love it. I love it. 16? Woo! We also have, how old are you, little man? Five. Hard to beat. Five. Co Hard to beat. Come on up and get and get your prize. I think Vernon might have one for you if you're if you're 16. He said he had an extra copy to give away. It's a young man right back there with Barry. You coming on up? All right. There you go, Boston. Oh, I love it. Love it. Thank you for being here. What questions? What ahas? Yes. Who's been dying to say something, my extroverts, that hasn't had the chance yet? Where do you find the... Uh... Oh, where do you find the company that has the models and the photographer? Fascinating question. What do we think? I know where to find the photographer. I know where to find... Dalton? You can, you can round up some models? <laughs> so Horizon Horizon Media Group as does our real estate photography. They can do some excellent things. That's a great question on sourcing the models. They I got do some, some ideas. outstanding stuff with cabins. Also, um, you know who's a great resource for this, but she already left is Megan. Also, if you need this, Henry Sanchez uh, actually was a model, still does a little on the side back there, right? <laughs> you may recognize him <laughs> from the pages of the Gap. Uh, Henry Henry has been volunteered to be a mom. Maybe he'll bring Boston along for you. All right, charming family. Um, that's a great question. I got some, some resources for you. Megan just has done some things like that. We got a couple companies I think that might, but we're gonna do a little digging because I can't answer the model thing off the top of my head. That's a great question. But. I know some people have like a modeling agency, but. Yeah, have yeah, to that's, that's solvable. Beautiful collaborate, yeah, yes. we'll put it together. Here you go, Is Jason. Your own website for re for I, I imagine it's more useful for repeat booking. So once people have stayed through a platform, you have a, your own website that you refer them to to avoid the hosting fees for the platforms. Is that has that is that actually worth the effort at pursuing? That's something I've been curious about. the maybe nuanced things that you might want to say we can't grow your portfolio as far as on your website so I always recommend that people have that extra layer especially if it's like a high-end property or just something that has some niche things that you want to kind of promote that we might not be able to put on our website it like not worth it necessarily no I think it is it is worth it Yes, yeah, yeah, especially yeah. for self-managing. But if you're if you're just and doing both, I think is really helpful because um, you can push through all those different channels with your website. Well, and there's also one thing that people don't understand about the third-party booking sites and their algorithm. Um, if you're sending people to looky loo at Airbnb, VRBO. They're hurting your ranking on there because if you, they if they click and they don't book, your ranking's going to go down. 
Mm-hmm. So having that external site for people to go look at your properties on is actually pretty valuable. Does that make sense? So your external website would be the top of your funnel, right? And then when they expressed interest, they could book through those platforms. Like you could add a button right off your, your website. It's a landing page. Yep. Uh, Facebook page. Yeah, Facebook or Instagram. So I guess for your website, it'll be totally worth it because for one, you're paying 3% or 5% on VRBO. On your direct booking website, you can save that and you get charged that to the guest possibly. So instead of 3%, you could charge 2% extra to a guest. Also, you never know when Airbnb is just going to throw off your property or they're going to unlist your property. Sometimes they just do that as well. So it's where, it's well worth it to have your own website because eventually you want to move to a direct booking website as much as you can. I saw another hand up. One thing that wasn't talked about is insurance when you're short-term rental. And it's just really important to get either... What wasn't, what wasn't talked about? The short-term rental insurance. Okay. Um, it, it's just a, an expense that you're going to want to probably invest in. Um, and if not, talk to your homeowner's insurance and figure out exactly what you can do because you are going to have incidents that happen in your house. They're going to break furniture. Things are going to... you want and Possibly bed bugs, and you want it to be covered. So it's just an expense to look into. And... There are well-known carriers that'll cover that. I've also seen people use national and then they're like, tell me they can only get high risk insurance. So ask, and they were coming from a consulting company and they could not find insurance. And I'm like, I easily found it for them with several mainstream state farm offers it as a second home. There's lots of places they can get insurance from decorators looking for decorators. Horace is looking for decorators. Okay. We got some, Got some resources, and there's also some resources we can point you in the direction of uh, that do that as well. Yeah, Michelle. Um, ADUs. Okay, so. So the question is about accessory dwelling units. So an accessory dwelling unit is anything. It's an additional unit on your your property. They're approved everywhere in the city of Knoxville by Recode. So it's something like Dominic's Carriage House. Yes. So I've already checked out the size and everything. I can add one. The thing is, the neighbor, it's, it's the city lot, but I could, I don't know if it's worth like fighting for or going after. The neighbor don't want the trees cut down. It's full of trees right now. Is it worth going? To, it's on my side of the fence. Though. The neighbor doesn't have a say. He doesn't have what? He doesn't have a say. He doesn't have a say, and you cut trees on your own property. Yeah, it's your lot. Yeah. But what what I mean, Michelle was asking about is, is doing an accessory dwelling unit. And actually, Charles Gorman that runs that Sono Investor Group, we were talking about it. He went and called the city. So if you want, give him a shout. I can point you the direction. And got this skinny on ADUs. You can build an ADU, an accessory dwelling unit, anywhere in the city unless it's explicitly prohibited. Some of the restrictions are going to be on the size, right? And it's only available if you're occupying the property as a primary residence, right? So that thing we talked about before, the type one permits, like that's going to work for you as like renting out you know, you're, you're maintaining it over there. Yeah, Jason. Are you asking, do you have to play? To play nice with your neighbors. Um, and yes, we all went to kindergarten. You should, you should try to play. No, 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 yes, you should try to play nice with your neighbors, but just in the question of like fighting with them. I, can you speak, I can't speak intelligently about the permitting process. I'd want to go look at it before I, I couldn't tell you what say the neighbors have in that, if there's a review period or not. If there's a review period, then sure, whether there's a comment period by the neighbors, then yes, it would probably would be worth looking at. Sure. So, so, so Jason's Jason saying you have to notify know. your neighbors. So yes, obviously. But uh, I would have that conversation, Vinchel. Like, you can't. In terms of cutting down the trees in your property, he really doesn't have a say if you cut down the trees in your property. That just is. That's your trees. Well, I was saying, is it worth going? Cause it's this, so it's like the, the, the bushy area. Part of it's the city and part of it's mine. So I would have to ask them for their part. It's like my line. Got it. Let's let's talk about it after. I don't I don't know. I don't talk to your neighbor. You know what I mean? I have no idea who you're looking to. It might not be worth it. It could be insane. But it could just be a conversation. Yeah. Totally. Cool. 
Thank you all for coming out. Yeah, pop it up. Your pop-up event. So we got two things that are coming up. Two things. There is Vacasa, Henry Nathan. If you're curious about going really deep, if you wanted, if we didn't go deep, anybody have questions we didn't really hit? You're looking for like a master class? Anybody? Crushed it. Man. Perfect. Mic drop. No. Um, if you want to go really deep on one property, is it the 18th we're doing this? So the 18th, there's a link in the Grid Facebook group. We'll jump in there um, as well. But Vacasa is going to go really deep for us on how do you analyze one property? How do you pull comps on it? Let's look at specific numbers. Let's look at the pro forma. What should it perform? It's also a place to like think about the questions we didn't answer today. You can jump online, but just you can go in there. You can sign up. Do me a favor, post it again tomorrow so it bumps back up. Right, and you can come sign up on there. We'll all go deep, and it's a place for anyone else. Please come. This is a collaborative environment. Like all of these things are open to everybody. Right, we're all sharing the platform. Speaking of, yeah, pop up event Saturday. Pop -up event. So I had twenty something people say they want to know about new construction. Anybody interested in doing new construction? Like as an awesome. So we've got a new construction spec uh, that my partner Pedro Benitez built. Vita Custom Home over at 2624 Washington Avenue. If you want to come out, we'll be out there on Saturday from 12 to 3. I'll be holding an open house. If you've been to one of our investor open houses before, come. We will walk you through the whole process. Explain anything you want to know from, from the ground up. We can show you the other one that we did across the street as well. So if you're curious about learning and how that play works, we will be out there for three hours. Um, and I will create a Facebook event tomorrow. There is a post right there. If you go into Grid Facebook, just go in and comment, Bill, if you want me to add you to it. All right, guys? Cool. That'll be a good one. Cool. All Don't right. forget, please leave us a review. Right. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming no 4. out. No 4.7s. We need five stars, remember? <laughs> five stars all the way around, exactly. Uh, make sure to RSVP for next month's meetup. We're going to be diving into 1031 tax deferred exchanges and other tax saving strategies. So right in time for the end of the year, we're going to be diving all into that. Right. Thank you again so much. Really appreciate everybody coming out. Feel free. Let's hang out. Yes. <laughs>